came back. Yeah. Well, I don't know. We don't know if these are the same. Some of them are the same people. Yeah, <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. You're in the right place. If you uh, wanted to come to session two of Housing Development 101, Navigating Affordable Housing Development in Oregon. Seems like a big promise. Uh, next slide. Uh, so real quick, this is part two of our three-part session. So part one covered whether you should want to do development roles and the feasibility process. In part two, we're going to pretend that you got through your feasibility process and said, heck yeah, this is something we want to do. And we've got this stuff figured out. So uh, this is this session is going to take us from funding to closing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're going to talk about the rapidly changing landscape of financing. Don't forget to catch the OHCS engagement session tomorrow at 3.15. Talk about rapidly changing. These My disclaimer on these slides is this is based on the current funding system. Um, but all the principles are the same. So we're going to budget for... Uh, develop the design of an affordable housing project in Oregon. Um, we're going to talk about some of the hurdles uh, and also the ways to clear them during the pre-development process. Uh, we're going to dive a little deeper into those funding sources. Um, lots of challenges. We're gonna, like, do we have to say challenges every slide? Um, we're also going to talk about the opportunities. Uh, and then we're going to talk about just putting all those uh, financial pieces together um, with that eye on the prize. I think we used the words North Star in the last slide um, of a project that you actually can operate successfully. So that's our goal. Um, next slide. So rather than do the identical thing we did last time, we're gonna start with raise your hand if you were not in the first session. Okay, now we're gonna do some of this again. This is cool, this is fun. Um, Cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna add, so um, raise your hand if you're a developer. Excellent. Uh, resident services provider, supportive services provider, or in that continuum. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna lump these together board member, uh, executive director, or self-described senior management, the buck stops at, on, or near you. Um, asset and property managers, some of our favorites. Yes, asset and property managers. Uh, and then something else. And if you raise your hand, I'll make you say what? <laughs> okay, oh, good. Construction managers, do we have? Okay, so how many more construction folks do we have in the room? Architects, people willing to admit they're architects. <laughs> Good. Uh, one more. What's another something else? Green building consultant. There you go. Um, and then one we didn't do last time. Uh, raise your hand if you, uh, the organization you're here to represent, already owns affordable housing. Okay, good. Some, but not all. Uh, and then um, you've been through a development cycle before. Okay, good. Thank you. So we know who's in the room. Lots of different perspectives, which is perfect. Uh, next slide. I'm going to rush through our credibility slide for those who were here last time. Um, so all of us work for the Housing Development Center. We are a nonprofit uh, development and asset management consultant uh, operating primarily in the state of Oregon, also somewhat Washington. Uh, this is our 30th year. Happy birth, 30th birthday to us. Um, we are perhaps uh, the bulk of our work is in as development consultants. Um, so we 
uh, you, we assist organizations to meet their mission. We bring technical real estate experience. Uh, we've developed over 8,000 units, 300,000 square feet of uh, nonprofit facility space. Um, we can help you meet your vision. Um, and then we have a three-person asset management team. I'm not sure that those numbers are skewed the way they should be because that is our team that helps sustain these buildings for 99 years. <laughs> so their job sounds bigger than the development job. Uh, and then we're also a lending institution. So part of helping us meet your mission, helping you meet your mission is um, we've got, we're a certified uh, CDFI so we can help loan funds to help you uh, make your project happen. So that's why they thought we might be able to help with this presentation. Uh, our mission is centering those who have been historically oppressed uh, to collaborate with our partners to envision, develop, and sustain affordable homes and community places. Next slide. Uh, and so I kind of talked about all this stuff. Yes, I did. Uh, except policy and industry support. Uh, so we also, because uh, we've been doing this for 30 years, most of us actually doing this for 30 years up on this stage. Um, we uh, try to lend that ex collective experience um, to supporting your policy goals, the things that you're seeing in your community that could make things better. Um, and so that's another, another thing that we uh, try to spend our time and talent to do. I'm going to make a plug for our property and asset management work group, POMWOG, any POMWOG members in the room, I'm sure. Yep. Yep. <laughs> there they are. Um, at HDC's table in the lobby, there's a flyer. If you don't know about POMWOG, it, sorry, it's an unfortunate acronym, but it's just stuck it's with us acronym. over the years. I love people it. make fun of it all the time. Um, uh, if you don't know about POMWOG and you're an asset manager in the affordable housing industry, please go by our table and grab our flyer. Um, we meet every month. Um, they're asset managers from all over the state of Oregon. We talk shop, we have trainings, we do peer sessions. Um, we have anywhere from 25 to 35 people attend every month online. Uh, so grab a flyer and email us to get on our email list and join our group. It's free. <laughs> That's it. Plug over. <laughs> For now. Okay. So without further ado, uh, we are going to start the pre-development process with Julie. Uh, for those who may uh, be new to this group, uh, I'm Julie Prooks, uh, Director of Real Estate Development. I come from the uh, architecture side of the table, um, long history uh, as an architect, building special needs and affordable housing, always been my passion. Um, so we had to rush through the kind of the what do we do with the site uh, stuff in our last session. So I'm going to get a little more into it. We talked a lot about all the risks and things to watch out for. Um, and in the design effort, uh, I like it. Like pe some people say it's like peeling an onion. You go through layer by layer by layer. I like to think of it, um, you get to the core of the onion, you just got more onion. I like to think of it more of like uh, cracking the nut. So the hard outer, sh walnut has a hard outer skin and then you get through the fleshy kind of messy stuff. And then there's a really hard shell to get to the gem of what you're looking for. Um, and that is a lot of the design process. Uh, Andrea referred to mistakes. We are all going to make a lot of mistakes through this whole process. And it's really about the team that you assemble and the willingness to dive in and, and figure out all those challenges and how to solve the mistakes. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about determining site capacity um, and uh, the jurisdictional requirements that a property uh, might have to meet. 
uh, your architect um, primarily uh, will head up a design team. You're going to look at the zoning requirements. Um, what capacity can this site meet in terms of uh, the density, the number of units, how high? You're going to look at transportation. We talked a little bit about transportation systems. So what does the city require for parking? And in Portland, that's kind of an evolving thing right now. Uh, what is the city going to require for parking and what do you need for parking? Um, sometimes we've needed little buses. Sometimes we need um, more bike parking. Sometimes we need it's we need to think outside the box a little bit and make sure we're meeting the needs of the particular project. What kind of outdoor connection do you want? This is a passion of mine, I have to admit. You'll see this throughout. Uh, what kind of outdoor connection do you want your residents to have? What kind of interior spaces do you need to support your residents beyond just their um, just their units. And so you start to determine how much area you have to build on um, for your project. Another issue is in regards to environmental remediation. In the last session, we talked about there's all kinds of things that could be hiding behind that grassy field. And in this phase, this is really where you take a look at how are we going to pull out this storage tank and what kind of soils are going to be left behind? Is there a, an unintended benefit of, of digging out all that soil that we can use the site in a different way? Uh, especially in Oregon and the Mid Willamette Valley, geotechnical is more and more of an issue. So, what are what is this what is the that soil composition and how are we going to build? Uh, you, we look at the floor and there's a lot going on underneath the floor. Um, and sometimes that can be very technical um, with a, a variety of different systems uh, to support that building. The site might be near a, a railroad, a freeway, a airport. Uh, so how are we going to abate for noise? And there's a lot of creative solutions. You can put in, you know, triple glazed windows. You can also uh, do some walls. You can organize your site in a way um, that buffers the noise. And um, if in that previous phase you identified a wetland, how are you going to use that to your benefit? How is that going to benefit your um, outdoor spaces? Uh, sometimes you can mitigate for the wetlands and create additional um, space. So taking a look at all those um, cautions and risks that we learned about in the feasibility phase and using them to figure out how that's going to influence our design. And then we're going to look at funding requirements. So we talked about uh, the scoring criteria and the the ever-changing uh, landscape of what OHCS or the city or uh, whoever might be your major funding source, what uh, requirements are they going to have on your project um, in terms of population, uh, green building, um, and other elements uh, that, that are always different. <laughs> um, and then schedule constraints. So during this phase, you're going to take a keep an eye on um, all of the various issues and how they're going to play out. Uh, you'll be working with your architect uh, through the design process. If there's any land use design permit approval processes that are outside the norm, those need to be factored in. Um, funding constraints often have a time limit associated with it. So you're you're managing this schedule from the outside in and the inside out and making sure that your team's needs are being met. And then all of these milestones are also being met. 
And then the most important is again, to keep those program goals in the forefront that North, you know, we talk about the North star, we talk about our mission, uh, making sure that in, as we are addressing the site and the environment and the funding requirements that we keep coming back to, are we meeting the mission for our residents and are we doing uh, the project that our board is thinking we're doing and that our community needs and um, and uh, we we keep circling back to make sure that uh, the resident needs are met, the neighborhood needs are met, uh, and your organization's needs are met. And you're talking to asset and property management and, you're and talking services to, people. It's in my next slide. I'm pretty sure. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, see, it's in my next slide. Yes, always we're talking to our property and asset management. Um, so uh, within uh, Andrea in the last session talked about kind of the phases in, in general, we have the feasibility phase, we have the pre-development phase and we have the construction lease up phase. Uh, within the pre-development phase, there are also design phases. So your architect is going to go through a series of design cycles, getting better and better clarity. You as the owner and your development consultant will review the sets of plans to make sure that they're still meeting your program goals and mission. Uh, you will... Um, uh, you'll be getting... You'll be working with your contractor to do uh, cost estimates. So through the design cycles, you'll be getting better and better clarity about what this building is, what this project is, and what it's going to cost. Um, you're going to uh, circle back and make sure that the design and construction standards are met. Uh, we rely on the OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Services Core Development Manual, has a list of requirements that each, if you are funded through OHCS, each project will need to meet. You're going to need to make sure you're meeting those environmental um, standards uh, in terms of remediation. You're going to make sure you're meeting your sustainability standards uh, that you are striving to meet, as well as the jurisdiction requirements. And remember to always include feedback from property and asset management. Um, and they are really core and uh, they are some, my favorite and uh, most important touchstones in terms of checking in on materials, space, connections from one space to another, where doors are located, what those doors are, um, they're, they are critical. Um, and then during this time, like I said, uh, you're resolving all of those things. We come up with, in the feasibility phase, we come up with a, a whole list of concerns, um, uh, risks, challenges that need to be met, and you'll make some assumptions. You have to move in a forward direction. So you will make assumptions, you will document those assumptions. And then through the design process, you will make sure that those uh, issues are resolved, they're tested and they're pulled together. Um, and uh, through this, we like to remind ourselves, we've heard um, the everything bagel syndrome where uh, funding wants all the, funders want all these different benefits of a project. Um, a neighborhood wants all these uh, things that your project is going to provide. Uh, your architect uh, has an aesthetic that they want to build to. And really, we need to keep in mind the what's and the why's of why we're doing this. We'll come back to it again and again and again. Of course. I, I just want to emphasize that last point as well. And the idea of who should weigh in and setting expectations about that. Uh, at, the, at the end of our last session, I think we really emphasized the importance of during the development process, connecting with your resident services staff, your prospective residents, your neighbors, bringing everybody along, getting their feedback and making sure that what you're developing actually meets people's needs. 
but it's also important in that process to make sure that you set expectations about what folks can weigh in on. So as a, as a really excessive example, uh, asking your residents, what amenities do you want in this property? And they turn around and say, I want a swimming pool. And you're like, great, you're not getting a swimming pool. And you've already ruined your credibility with them. So it's really, it's setting those expectations and being realistic about where folks can weigh in, informing them about the parameters of all of these other uh, attributes that you need, all of these other requirements that you need to meet and making sure to bring them along and get their feedback on the things that they can give feedback on. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Nope, that's one. Um, so uh, we touched a little bit on the first session about building your team, bringing your architect in and the uh, very early stages to help you uh, figure out what you can build on the site. Um, that will be very conceptual to start with. And then through those design processes, they will become more and more defined and specific. Um, I also just wanted to put a plug in on the importance of not only asset and project property management, but uh, the importance of bringing your general contractor in early. Uh, there are sometimes discussions about, you know, well, shouldn't we do a bid project, a, a bid proposal, or um, why would we be bringing the general contractor in and they can just charge us whatever they want to? Uh, they cannot. Um, there are a lot of checks and balances along the way, and and it's um, there are so many benefits to bringing them in early. Um, in terms of constructability. So is this project, like architects, I am an architect, I will speak for myself. We have these high, high ideas of what we want to build. Um, we want to build this uh, uh, cantilevered structure to cover a children's play area uh, to protect them from the rain. Well, that's not actually feasible. So uh, they give us good constructability tests. They help uh, make sure that our um, details for the envelope, you'll hear a lot. If we were talking about a preservation project and renovating uh, existing housing, we'd be talking a lot about that envelope. The envelope is the ex thank you, the exterior skin of a building. So your framing and then your uh, plywood flashing, insulation, siding. Um, uh, through the eighties, we did not build very well. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Integrative design and construction um, is an important. Uh, uh, way to approach design. They will also provide uh, an understanding of the initial cost versus life cycle cost. So sometimes things that uh, when you get to uh, your construction budget and you're working on uh, the cost of the project, there is a tendency to want to uh, uh, get so choose a product that might be less expensive that might actually be a more costly solution in the long run because that item uh, doesn't hold up as well as as another. A, a good example, I, there are problems with every um, product, but a good example is like your counters. So a plastic laminate counter is a very cost-effective solution. It's pretty, it, you can choose any color you want, uh, but depending on uh, the sink and how much space there is around the sink, it, degrade, it can degrade really quickly and a solid surface counter is more expensive in the long run, but holds up, uh, sorry, more expensive in the front end and holds up um, much longer. There's uh, questions of construction logistics. So especially if you're working in a tight urban site, how are you going to bring in the materials? How are you gonna store things? How are you going to actually get this building built, the, co the general contractor is uh, very helpful with those. Sometimes in these unprecedented times, we're dealing with material shortages. And so understanding what's going on in the market in the time that you are currently 
working and knowing we need to get that elevator purchased ASAP or the ERV unit, the uh, ventilation unit um, that we are putting in units. There are different materials and it's not always the same. It's different uh, each round, each month it's different even. Um, and so understanding the, the material ordering, utility coordination, working with your electric company, your uh, water company to start to figure out what we can bring to the site. Uh, and then building relationships with our certified minority women emerging and veteran owned businesses more and more. This is a requirement of funders. Uh, it is a goal. It is a per personal mission of HDC is to promote uh, those businesses. And the GC is critical in building those relations. General contractor, yes. Uh, take away acronyms, uh, general contractor is critical in building those relationships and reaching out to uh, smaller businesses that may not necessarily um, uh, be part of the standard pool or create relationships uh, between different entities. And then the construction schedule. So I spoke about the schedule uh, with the design and getting to pre-development, but understanding how long it's going to take to build that project to make sure that all the needs are also met. So I could not, I could speak up here for hours about why the general contractor should be in early. I've probably spoken too long already. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on uh, that is so valuable is maintaining that budget. And so as you're going through the design cycles and your general contractor is pricing each set, the project may go over, it sometimes goes under budget, very rarely, uh, sometimes it goes over budget. And you go through a process that in the industry we'll call value engineering, where we identify either products that maybe cost less or ways of doing things that might uh, be a little different and cost less, or we move things into what's called an ad backlist. And this is where, when I was talking earlier about your wish list, we always want to keep your wish list. We always want to know priorities. And sometimes they have to go back into that ad backlist, but we don't lose them. We keep those wishes and desires. Uh, as we go through construction, there is oftentimes abilities to bring those wishes into the project. Uh, so with each design cycle and each cost estimate, then we're going to go through a process of refining the design so that that design will meet uh, our budgetary requirements that need to fit in our funding strategy. All right, next slide. And then I will stop talking. Uh, so then we get to this squishy phase. Um, the design is done. It's, we submit for a permit. We're going to go through the building permit process that's mostly between the architect and the city. Their owner might be involved in land use approvals, uh, which will require some neighborhood contacts, might require uh, uh, making a presentation to the board, uh, the city um, uh, planning commission. Thank you. Um, there's also a potential for as what we call systems development charge fee waivers. So that helps your budget, depending on what jurisdiction you're working in. Not all jurisdictions allow these, but there is an opportunity to get fee waivers for charges that the city imposes on a project for things like the transportation system, schools, um, uh, water system. What? Oh, I thought you said something. Uh, water and sewer system in order to for the city to pay for expanding these systems, a new project will often be charged these systems development charges. And so it's really important to go to your city and ask, I'm building affordable housing. Will you give us a fee waiver? Uh, they will not always, but sometimes. And then understand your city's timeline. So right now it with uh, with the push for affordable housing, the permit process is taking much longer. 
Um, and so understanding what your city's schedule is for getting that review out there uh, is really important in your overall uh, schedule. You'll also be negotiating the general contractor's contract. And this is my least favorite part of the project. Uh, here we have to make sure that all of the needs are accommodated in the contract and that might include liquidated damages. So there may be a provision where if the contractor uh, is delayed in delivering the units, there may be a penalty. Uh, you may need... To, the contractor may want to release retention. So with every construction project, you hold back 5% um, with each pay request of retention. And there are, con there are subcontractors that may be done really early in the project and it's a burden for them to have that 5% hold back. So we may uh, negotiate a release of retention. Uh, common recently is force majeure. So COVID, uh, COVID, 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 COVID um, had an effect on how we uh, managed projects and they relied on that force majeure language to be able to have a delay on their project. And so making sure that all of the uh, different requirements are included in the contract uh, is done in this phase. And then insurance. And that is beyond my understanding. Insurance is a big issue. Uh, there are insurance companies are requiring more and more and more from their general contractor um, in terms of security, fire watch, uh, all different things. Um, and that is a project by project, city by city negotiation. And then we are, again, I come back to it again and again, we're finally resolving those site issues uh, that we have been going through um, on all of the other uh, phases. So. Thanks, Julie. Uh, for those of you who weren't here in our last session, uh, I'm Travis Phillips, uh, along with Julie. I'm the other director of real estate development at Housing Development Center, uh, working with our teams who are supporting clients to develop uh, <clears throat> new affordable housing. Uh, and uh, for those of you who weren't in the prior session also, uh, feel free if you have questions, if there are things that, you, that come up, uh, if there's an acronym that we forget to explain that you're like, what the heck is that? Uh, please just raise your hand, jump in. Uh, we'll be happy to take questions as we go, or if we're getting to it a little bit later, we'll mark it down to make sure to come back to it. Um, but in terms of, uh, so uh, so Julie, uh, Julie's expertise is really weighted on the construction side of things. My expertise lands a little bit more on the finance side of things. Uh, and so as we're moving through that pre-development process, uh, you know, the, the train is out of the station, you know, you're doing a project and you just got to get it funded and get it into construction. What are those finance considerations through there? Uh, and so the first one being NOFAs and public funds, uh, notice of funding availability is what NOFA stands for. Uh, here in the city of Portland, it might be a bond opportunity solicitation. It might be a NOFO, uh, which is a notice of funding opportunity. Every different actor that you can possibly think of uh, for the availability of money to pay for your project. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit more here uh, in the next few slides, but just noting that uh, you're threading a needle of restrictions. So the more funding that you get, uh, and unfortunately it's rare that there's just one or two sources of funding that you need to bring to a project to get your project done more often than not, uh, and more now than ever before, uh, there is funding lasagna and it is every, it is, it's not just like the five layer lasagna that your mom made. It's like the hundred layer lasagna from, you know, who knows where. Um, but with each different layer of funding that you bring to your project, uh, each new funder brings their own restrictions and requirements. Uh, and so it's important to be aware as you're going through that uh, to make sure that those align uh, or understand that you can still thread that needle. And to make sure, going back once again to those must-haves and want-to-haves, 
uh, that those funding restrictions and requirements that you're so eager to get that money because you really want to bring this project to your community that you're not unintentionally painting yourself in a corner that you can't serve the folks that you want to serve. Can I make a quick comment? Yes. Uh, in regards to, I mentioned that in the first session, in regards to multiple funding sources, and as Travis said, with every funding source comes a layer of compliance that goes with that. One of the really important things, again, involving asset management and property management is mapping. We call it kind of compliance, like set aside mapping. Um, if you have 10 sources of funding, probably eight of those are going to require specific set asides. Like we want five units that are at 50% and seven units that are at 60%. And we want 10 units at 30%. You have to map all of that. And then you have to make sure that they all coordinate uh, and the most restrictive wins. And that is getting more and more and more challenging, which makes it more difficult for asset and property management to manage the project. So it's super, super important. We'll be talking about that more in the third session and the session after that in this room. Thanks, Katie. Um, so as you're moving through that, you're figuring out all your funding, you're doing your design development, your construction budget continues to evolve, right, Julie? <laughs> uh, and the and it's important to think about the role of your construction manager, uh, your architect, your general contractor, uh, and continue to tack to those important mission and organizational goals. So as your design develops and evolves, and you get that next set of construction estimates back, and you find out that with a little bit more detail, it's a little bit more expensive you're adding things to that add back list. Uh, so it's maybe things that you're not ready to, to let go of your hopes and dreams yet, uh, but you know that you can't afford them just in this particular scenario. So it's holding on to those or it's making those choices about upfront costs versus life cycle costs. Um, anything to add to that, Julie? Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so it's continuing to evolve that. Uh, and now we're going to get into a little bit uh, about the pro forma uh, or the financing for the project. So the next slide. So I'm just going to underscore a little bit here um, what the funding challenges are, what what we're trying to solve, what the uh, what the needles are uh, that we're trying to thread with affordable housing development. And uh, and I'm going to apologize again because I've got a few different funding scenarios that were borrowed from other presentations or built for this presentation. They're not all the same project, but it'll give you a few different perspectives on what projects look like. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a single unit. Say it's a three-bedroom unit. Uh, maybe it's at 30% median family income. That's what that MFI stands for. Or you might also see that as area median income, AMI. 30%, you're serving some of the extremely low income folks in your community. Or maybe you're targeting somebody at 50% MFI or, uh, or a working family at 60% MFI. The land cost is the same for that. You're architecture, your permitting fees, your financing costs, all of those soft costs are the same regardless of what incomes you're serving. Your construction costs are exactly the same regardless of the income of the person uh, or the household that's living in that unit. So your cost of building that three bedroom unit doesn't change. But depending on uh, the income level of the household that you're supporting in there really impacts the ability uh, to bring in mortgage debt to help pay for that. Uh, and this is really the difference between how much additional subsidy, how much additional money you need versus being able to go to the bank and borrow. Um, that mortgage amount is, is supported by the unit rent. You identify your gross revenue, all the money that you're expecting to get, to get in from rent, less a little bit of vacancy, um, less your operating expenses, and you get your net operating income there has to be enough net operating income plus whatever cushion you agree to with all your lenders and public funders in order to cover your regular mortgage payments. That's the principal and interest, just the same as your home mortgage. Say so you've got that 30% MFI household in that unit, 
you've got a 30 year mortgage that's at six and a half percent interest, which may be a little bit optimistic at this exact moment. Um, their income, the amount of income that you get from the rent that they can afford in those units, hopefully covers, maybe just covers, maybe doesn't even quite cover the operating expenses for that unit. You can't support any debt uh, to bring to bring in to bring additional funds to actually pay for the construction. If it's a 50% income household or a 60% income household, they can support some of that, but you've still got a three, four, 450, maybe more $450,000 gap uh, in your ability to build that single unit, let alone the whole development. So this is where additional sources, additional that public subsidy comes in uh, to help make that work uh, to help make it possible to build that project. We're just, so so the table up here, uh, the question is, is this assuming 60% MFI or 30 or, or 50 in Multnomah County? This is just an example. This isn't county specific. It's intended to just give you an idea that at different income levels, you might be able to support a little bit of a mortgage debt for that for that property. So you have a difference of maybe for a single unit, $100,000 in how much you need. There's a $100,000 difference based on who you're serving in terms of how much additional support financially you need in order to make that project work. Uh, so next slide. So we're going to address that funding gap. How do, you, how do you do that? Where do you get that money from? Well, there are about four different ways, four different approaches uh, that you can take to make that work. We can, uh, starting from the bottom of the, of the house here, the building, you can reduce the cost to develop. You can reduce the costs to finance it. You can lower the costs to operate it. So the difference between the revenue that you bring in from rent and the expenses that your property has is less and maybe you have more money uh, to actually pay for a loan. Uh, or you bring in other sources to fill that gap. Uh, so next slide. So that first layer uh, of the building is reducing the cost to develop. Julie, do you want to talk about this a little bit or do you want me to run with it? Um, so this is this is the importance of the design phases and cost estimating. So as you go through uh, what the architect might refer to as the schematic design phase, design development, construction documents, you'll be getting updated cost estimates and you will be testing that against your budget. Um, I test it with my what I call my finance buddy. Uh, here is our current construction estimate, and how does this fit into that budget? And if it if it is if it's breaking the budget in any way, then we have to go back to our team and we look at uh, potentially reducing um, a space or changing out materials or putting more items on the add back list, not losing them but putting more items on that add back list to make sure that that construction budget stays within the confines of that uh, overall budget. And then I'll, I'll talk about the third bullet too. Well, I can talk about all three. Uh, third bullet is the systems development charge waivers that I was spot speaking about earlier. Um, permit waivers, there's, there often isn't any, uh, permit waivers, but depending on the jurisdiction, you may be able to get, uh, what we for, refer to as an SDC waiver, and then that free and discounted land, uh, benefits the project. But remember what I said before, there is no such thing as free land. There is often, uh, other items that have to be accommodated with that land, um, that needs to be incorporated in the budget. So, and I would just note uh, one of the issues that we had several decades ago with affordable housing was we built cheap housing because the idea was the more units that we can put on the ground, the cheaper we can build them, the more people we can help. 
Uh, it was super well intentioned, uh, but it comes with unintended consequences and cheap housing isn't always good housing. Uh, I think one of the things that's fantastic about our industry and where we've evolved to, uh, not that it's more expensive, but that we're actually so focused on building good housing for folks and good housing that's good for the duration of the time that folks will live in there. Next slide. Uh, so lowering costs to finance, uh, there are some super in the weeds uh, ways that we can talk about this, but I'll just cover a couple of big picture items. Lowering the cost to finance might be looking at things like the, afford the Oregon Affordable Housing Tax Credit or OAHTC. Uh, that is a state tax credit uh, that certain lenders work with that will help to buy down the interest rate. So instead of paying that six and a half percent or maybe seven, seven and a half percent that they're running right now, that's discounted. Uh, and for a period of time, in exchange for lowering rents and serving folks at lower incomes, you might have uh, some lower interest rates. That'll reduce your lowering, that'll reduce your cost of finance. But remember, every one of these incentives comes with its own restrictions. So uh, make sure to go in eyes wide open. Uh, as well as local, regional, state bonds uh, and other grants, the more free money that you get, the more money that has no interest payments, uh, the more money that comes in that you can front load on your project before you start drawing on your construction loan, before you start paying interest on uh, those funds that you've paid for for your construction loan, that can actually help reduce your cost as well. It's a very technical uh, and complicated road to navigate. Uh, so again, make sure that you're, you know, and you're considering uh, all of the implications of that, but there are some ways to reduce the cost by, uh, by using that low cost money first. Travis, can I add a comment? Any property and asset managers in the room will see the OAHTC <laughs> on this screen and shiver a little uh, because it is not easy uh, to stay in. Well, it's it depends on how you define easy. Um, it's a lot to navigate to stay in compliance with OAHTCs. It's one more layer of oversight that property and asset management has to monitor. So again, it's awesome to reduce your interest rate, uh, but remember what it does to your property and asset management teams who are going to have to keep it in compliance for the 20 years that it's going to be in place. I think there's a session on OAHTCs tomorrow afternoon for those who have suddenly become super curious about them. <laughs> yeah, thank you both. Um, I'll also just note one last note, super in the weeds, um, but a couple things, uh, especially with construction loans, which, uh, as Tracy mentioned, I think in the last session, construction loans historically or typically tend to be variable interest rate loans. Uh, and so as interest rates in our market fluctuate, uh, and of late fluctuate means going up very quickly, um, there are a couple things that we've seen come out in the market that provide some opportunity to mitigate that risk. Um, we are seeing on some projects now some fixed rate construction loans. Uh, those may be a little bit more expensive up front, um, but provide a little more certainty and potentially some benefit uh, if, our, if our interest rates continue to grow. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, and... Um, the other thing is we've seen some opportunity for interest rate hedging, and this is way more complex uh, than I fully understand, um, but essentially the deal is that uh, you work with uh, a lender uh, who is willing to take on a certain amount of the risk for you based on your projections of your project, how fast you're drawing down your construction loan, how much risk you're willing to take versus how much of the risk they're taking, uh, you pay for them to take that risk. Uh, and so again, going into it eyes wide open, understanding uh, what your options are, what your risks and benefit and what your tolerance is there. Uh, but there are some options to help uh, to help mitigate some of those risks. So uh, so the question is, uh, is there any such thing as a cap 
on that floating rate for construction loans. Uh, I mean, so I'll, I'll give uh, a couple answers there. One is uh, I'll just underscore, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but there's always opportunity uh, or there's always opportunity to ask an, an unasked question, as my dad said to me when I was growing up, is always an automatic no. Uh, and so you can always ask your lenders, can we set a cap on this? What does this look like? The reality is you're then passing that risk from yourself as the developer onto the lender, and the lender's probably going to charge you for it. Um, and that may be totally worth it to mitigate your risk. Um, uh, so to answer the question, uh, those opportunities are limited, um, but where you're concerned about risk, where we're in a, a continue to be in an unprecedented market, it's always important to ask those questions. Next slide. So the other way, uh, one other way that you can address funding challenges is to lower your cost to operate. Uh, and to the, the third bullet there, uh, if you reduce your operating costs, you potentially have more income in order to support your debt. And so then you have less need uh, to bring other sources into your project to pay to pay for it. Um, there may be things like property tax exemptions. Uh, Multnomah County uh, is more robust in that way than some of the other counties around the state, um, but, um, but other counties do provide property tax exemptions uh, or perhaps uh, discounts on the property tax in order to serve um, low income populations. So uh, make sure to check with your jurisdiction, advocate with your jurisdiction, uh, can, uh, you know, look at those opportunities. Um, utility cost savings. So all those upfront, uh, those, those upfront costs that you talked about that you're like, oh, I don't know, we might need to value engineer that out. Um, putting those solar panels on the building, put in that, uh, that efficient heating system or the lighting system or uh, that building envelope, the windows and insulation and everything in order to reduce your utility costs might actually be a really valuable investment to make up front in order to reduce your costs on an ongoing basis. Um, because remember, uh, you're going to pay those upfront costs once, but on an ongoing basis, you're going to pay those costs for the next 99 years that you own that property and the restrictions are in place. Um, again, talk to your property and asset manager because all of those decisions that you make up front have implications. That super efficient system that you put in may be a pain in the neck for your maintenance manager uh, to be able to service. It may, uh, it may last forever and you may have no problems with it and that's great. Um, but there, but there are uh, ramifications. Uh, I see Natalie in the audience, and I remember from her session last year talking about when you put those solar panels on the roof, make sure that you have a hose picket up there so you can wash them off so that they operate correctly. Because if you have to drag the hose up from somebody's bathtub on the third floor, your maintenance manager is really going to look at you with some nasty eyes next time you walk down the hallway. Uh, another, re and this is a true story, um, during COVID, a project was completed, had solar panels. Uh, the Not only did the asset manager leave the owner organization, but the property management firm changed. And suddenly no one even knew that there were solar panels. Yeah. So when someone came to inspect the project, it said, oh, well, we'd love to take a look at the solar panels. And the property manager said, what, what solar panels? So that's what I'm talking about. It's important collaboration, make sure everybody knows that project shall remain nameless, by the way. I'm going to have to take KT out for beers later to learn about that one, but <laughs> um, we can move on to the next slide here. Uh, and, and the final way that we'll talk about addressing the funding challenges, filling the gap. So it's all of those other sources. It's all of the other layers in the funding lasagna uh, to take the amount of debt that your property can pay, uh, the amount of all the other funds, and it's layering it on to figure out how to fully pay for your project. So that includes things like the low income housing tax credit uh, and equity investment that you bring to your project through that. You'll often hear people refer to that as LIHTC. Um, that comes, that's allocated by the state. Uh, it's more competitive now than it's ever been, um, but is 
the largest form of affordable housing funding uh, in our country. Uh, rent subsidy. Uh, so in our last session, we talked about two of the ways to achieve affordability uh, is to uh, set rents that are affordable to, affordable to folks at various incomes uh, and then figure out how to pay for your project. Otherwise, the second way is uh, that a resident only pays a portion of their income and there's a subsidy source that comes in uh, to pay the difference to you as owner in order to make you whole and in order to make uh, both those rents affordable, but also allow the property to operate sustainably uh, in a financial sense. So those increase the operating revenue, um, but there's never enough of those to go around. There's other federal funding, so Community Development Block Grant, the Home Investment Partnership, uh, or Housing Trust Fund. Those are what those acronyms are there. Uh, local subsidy, thank you to Portland and uh, Portland metro area voters for approving the housing bonds that have made so many affordable housing units possible to develop over the last several years. And uh, guess what? We need more of it because we haven't solved the problem yet. So uh, talk to your neighbors and make sure that we re-up those supports when they come back around. Uh, and then things like energy incentive. This is absolutely not a comprehensive list, but these are just some of uh, some of the um, things that are a little bit higher on the list. And so energy incentives, especially some new federal ones with the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that I know there were some, some sessions yesterday uh, helped to provide to uh, compensate for some of those upfront costs that benefit in overall operation. Driving this home, oh, sorry, that's loud. Um, driving this point home again, uh, if this were an affordable housing compliance training that I was doing, I would be talking about the fill the gap piece is all about compliance. So uh, like what I said earlier, if you have, if you fill that gap with tax credits, with CDBG, with home, with housing trust fund, with local money, every one of those sources comes with compliance layering, which makes your project harder to manage and oversee. I mean, we don't really have any options right now. Obviously we need more funds to, because development costs are getting pricier. It just requires asset and property management to get more training to understand how all these layers work together and how compliance can, I mean, compliance people are gold. So if you have a compliance person on your staff, hug them, give them lots of bonuses and all the things because it's really, really, really hard. So again, developers in the room, fill the gap, super important, different sources out there, but even $50,000 can come with a compliance layer that's going to make it super hard to manage your project long-term. So I can talk about that all day. Next slide. So that was a great segue, Katie, because so we're going to look at an example capital stack here. Uh, and this is this is based on a project that we worked on. Uh, it I've also uh, finessed it and morphed it uh, and uh, created some new assumptions and, and sort of made it work in a way that worked for this presentation. So don't take this as this is exactly what a project that does X thing costs, but just take this as an example of how that capital, that, that funding lasagna comes together. So you've got your low income housing tax credit equity. Uh, this is the 4% tax credit that covers normally roughly about a third of your project. This particular project that I built the example from was in, uh, I don't recall if it was a, a federal qualified census tract or difficult to develop area. Uh, but those are federally recognized areas that are that are a priority for tax credit investment. And so you get a basis boost and we've got a little bit more tax credit equity than we would normally have. I have a question mark next to competitive because within the last few years, uh, the amount of tax credit equity uh, and particularly the private activity bonds that must be accompanied for 4% tax credit equity uh, are now oversubscribed. Uh, and so it's kind of sort of competitive now and looks a little bit different than it has prior to the last few years. 
There's a second kind of tax credit equity that's referred to as 9% that covers more or less 60% of the cost of the project. And that is exceedingly competitive um, because obviously it provides more funding to the project and there's more need than there are resources available. We're showing here your permanent loan. That's not competitive. That's subject to negotiations with the bank uh, about how much income uh, will support to make sure that the bank feels like you can pay back that permanent loan. Uh, in this case, uh, that was about 21% of the total project costs. This particular example, I've included in here a Metro affordable housing bond, which is about another 30%. Those are competitive applications uh, to the point that KT just made. Uh, that Metro affordable housing bond, most jurisdictions had requirements and voters uh, approved it with the requirements that it served a certain number of units at 30% area median income. Remember, those don't support any debt on the project because you don't bring in enough income uh, in order to pay for the debt. Uh, but also make sure that your organization can support folks at that income and your property and asset manager know that there are those needs in the community and that your organization can serve those. The Metro bond also came with a requirement for family size units, two and three bedrooms. So if your organization isn't serving those populations, make sure, you know, this, this may or may not be a resource that works for your project, depending on exactly the exact details of the funding solicitation. So make sure that you've set that North Star uh, and you're tracking to it. Julie talked about system development waivers. Uh, those are a small piece of the pie, but an important one. Everything adds up. Uh, in this example, I've included the Oregon Multifamily Energy Fund. Uh, these are state funds. Um, that uh, are intended to help cover some of the incremental increased cost for energy efficiency measures that benefit both our community's climate goals, but also the operating expenses for the project. Here in Portland, we have the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, if you use that in place of the multi-energy fund, remember that there are a lot of different and unique requirements that come with Portland Clean Energy Fund or PCEF. Uh, that maybe have some additional labor costs or some additional hoops that you need to jump through. So make sure that you're going into that eyes wide open. Um, hopefully you were lucky enough to get a foundation grant to put things together. Uh, and some of that developer fee you earn, uh, your state agency, maybe your lender, other folks are gonna require you to put that back into the project and take as a deferred fee. Uh, over probably about the first 10 to 12 years of the project. That's a little bit of the cash flow that you've agreed to upfront that you as an organization can get back, but you actually have to operate your project according to your projections and have cash flow to pay that back. So coordinating with your property and asset manager, once again, is really important uh, to make sure that your assumptions up front are realistic and you actually get paid back that money. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, so say you're lucky enough to get a foundation grant or identify a foundation that you want to apply to a grant, uh, do those monies come with additional compliance or additional hoops that you need to jump through? Uh, and the answer to that question is, it depends. <laughs> um, some, your organization uh, or the property that you're developing and the details of it may be aligned to the foundation. And if you are aligned to their goals, they'll give you money and say, great, do with this what you please. You meet our mission. And you're like, that's awesome. We love you please come back for our groundbreaking and our grand opening. We would like to celebrate you. Mm -hmm. uh, and please keep giving us more money in the future. Uh, or it may be, uh, for example, a uh, federal home loan bank uh, is an organization that provides a, a significant amount of funding sometimes for projects. Uh, maybe it's a million dollars instead of 300,000, but there is definitely ongoing reporting for federal home loan bank, lots of hoops to jump through with their money. Yeah, and usually FHLB, Federal Home Loan Bank, has some 
set aside percentage, like we want five units set aside at 50%. Some other foundation grants won't necessarily name a percentage, like a 30 or 40, 50% income limit. They may say we want three units set aside for victims of domestic violence. It could be like more population serving population, um, which again is something it's uh, what you would need to look at to make sure that that population is something that your organization can is is a population your organization can support so it's all about alignment and it's all about understanding like can property and asset management meet those compliance requirements um for that particular source so good question and in addition to talking to your asset and property management staff when you apply for those foundation grants talk to your accounting and your development staff to make sure that they have the capacity to actually fulfill the reporting requirements of the grant. Uh, and we are, yeah, so uh, Tracy tells me we've got nine minutes. We're going to move ahead to the next slide. I'm going to breeze through this one pretty quickly because this just uses the prior example and all of those sources that we looked at on the last slide are on the left side. Uh, and on the right side, for the uses, uh, that's how you're spending all that money. Uh, and so this just really tacks back to that conversation we had that if you lower the construction costs or if you lower the financing costs, then you need less money to do all those things. Uh, or if you increase the construction costs, you have to find more of the things on the left side of that slide to pay for them with. Um, as well... Uh, thinking about contingency, you can pad uh, some of those numbers, that escalation contingency, the construction, your soft cost. But remember, the more you pad it to insulate yourself from other issues that may come up in the future, the more money that you have to get committed to the project in order to get it in construction. Next slide. So just thinking through a few of the hurdles here and how to overcome them. Uh, hard cost escalation, building in sufficient contingency, but thoughtfully understanding how much you need uh, so that you don't have to find more money for the project than you can get for it uh, is really important. That's both during pre-development and construction. Anything to add, Julie? Yep. Uh, soft cost challenges. So that's financing costs. Those are those interest rates that we talked about earlier opportunities to hedge or fix those. It's opportunities to bring down your soft costs via uh, permitting uh, or other waivers for incentives there. Um, talk to your property and asset manager about these operating budget busters. Insurance has been something special lately, which I know KT will get into in the session at the end of the day in this room here. Uh, accounts receivable has been another uh, really difficult challenge uh, just in the last few months, making sure that residents uh, who you move into your building uh, are paying their rents on a timely basis. Uh, there's some new state uh, regulations that give residents more opportunity to get current, but it provides some unique challenges in a lease-up environment. KT will talk more about that. Uh, understanding your owner paid versus resident paid expenses and utilities. There's benefits and drawbacks to both of those. Uh, also want to get asset and property management feedback on that. Next slide. Really not going to talk about this one, but just want to understand that in a low income housing tax credit or LIHTC ownership structure, uh, you as the uh, project sponsor are the general partner. You bring in your investor as a limited partner and co-own that project for the next 15 years. Uh, and so you've got somebody else looking over your shoulder. And so it's not just operating that for the benefit of the residents, but meeting everybody else's expectations. Next slide. This sort of details a little bit of that um, through the pre-development period and before you get into construction uh, and come into agreements with your investor. You're at risk. You're putting in all the money. When you get in with your investor, that limited partnership owns it, uh, and you are in those compliance period. You have to meet all your compliance things, or your investor does not get the tax credits that they invested in your project in order to get, and uh, and they will come down with a heavy hand. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully, you've worked closely with your asset and property manager and are meeting all of those goals well. 
uh, after the end of that initial 15 year compliance period with your tax credit investor, you then enter into uh, essentially the rest of eternity uh, where you as the sponsor uh, buy the investor's interest in the in the property uh, and you own it for, and it's actually probably, well, the extended use period for tax credits is up to an additional 45 years. Um, but all of those other layers of funding lasagna probably have a 99 year funding requirement. Uh, so you own it for another 85 years, if I did my math in the back of my head quickly, correctly. And the next slide uh, is our last one here today. And just noting uh, that pre-development moving into your closing period, um, getting into construction and actually getting your project built, that timeline is so important. Uh, and so uh, I know that you housing developers out there know this, but for resident services people, property management people, asset management people, your developer's probably going to hound you. Your developer's probably going to be on your back about some timeline that doesn't fit very well into all the other needs of your job. Uh, but the reality is every little schedule slip risks increasing interest rates, losing that rate lock that you got that protects you against future uh, future interest rate inflation. Uh, it There are so many pieces of the puzzle that have to come together uh, at that final moment of closing in order to get into construction. Uh, and so tacking to that timeline is so incredibly critical, even though some of the details just seem so trivial. So coordinate closely with your finance and accounting peers, as well as property and asset management uh, throughout the project to ensure that they are, uh, and this is perhaps uh, a little bit of an important thing to hit on very quickly and briefly at the end of this slide, but so that they're recording things accurately at the first time so that they know how to enter things into the accounting books so that when you get to the end of the project, you're not fixing problems that you could have uh, could have prevented at the front end. And I'll stop there. Uh, we are just about at time. Have a couple minutes for questions and are happy to hang out for a few minutes afterwards, too. Yeah, super. So the question is, what is the difference between the escalation contingency and reserves? So in that particular slide, uh, I had included a line item for escalation contingency. Uh, that may go away by the time that you get into construction. But the idea of that is that we've been in an environment for the last probably at least 10 years now where the cost of materials and labor to get your building built has been increasing uh, faster than we ever imagined. Uh, and so building in some buffer to ensure that the pricing that you get uh, at the point in time that you get your funding committed still is able to build your project at the point in time that you start construction, that's what that escalation is about. The reserves are what is really important to your property and asset manager. Uh, those may be replacement reserves. Uh, and so that's a predetermined amount of money uh, that you put into basically a savings account on a regular basis. That's generally something that you have to agree to that your public funders and your lender and investor are going to require. Uh, and that savings account is intended to uh, pay for capital improvements and replacements that you have to make over the time that you own the project because you don't have that cash flow to pay for you don't have your you don't have money just your property's not just uh, printing money for you to take care of those things and so you have to plan for that all up front. You may also have an opportunity for operating reserves. That's going to depend a little bit uh, on the funding sources and details, um, but those operating reserves uh, can be a little bit of a savings account uh, that when we enter into a global pandemic and your residents no longer have jobs and can't pay the rent uh, that you as the owner can still pay your uh, your electric bill and your water bill and things like that, even when you're not getting the income from the residents. Both of those reserves generally require 
every funder who's ever dipped their fingers into the project to give approval before you pull those reserves out or maybe some agreed upon criteria for when you pull those out. But those savings accounts, those reserves uh, are really important in order to sustain your project. And one thing that we're seeing more of now, and we'll talk about in our next session and then the last session of the day in this room is the importance of a lease up reserve. Um, that is something that was sort of out there a little bit on a few projects, but we're seeing it more regularly now and it's proving to be absolutely critical. So that's going to be something um, that we'll talk in detail about in our next session. Thanks, Katie. And I know we're between uh, you all and lunch right now. Happy to answer any more questions, either individually or as the room, but thank you all for joining us. And after lunch, uh, come back and we'll talk about what happens once you get into construction. And lease up. And lease up.